Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this ETUI AI talk. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo, and I'm a senior researcher at the Foresight Unit at the European Trade Union Institute here in Brussels. I'm happy to have you here online, but also physical in our premises. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome a very special guest from Indiana University, Professor Hamid Ekvia. He is teaching um, informatics and international studies, but also cognitive studies as well in Indiana. So uh, he just traveled all the way from the US to have a nice day in, in European universities, and he just stopped to visit us as well at ETUI. So today, Hamid, um, thank you very much for being here, first of all. Um, you are going to talk about very interesting topics relating to agency, autonomy, and accountability. What can you tell us about that? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Aida. Uh, thank you, uh, Maria and Sophie, for, for uh, helping uh, with organizing this. Uh, it's a pleasure here. This is one of the places where I really feel at home, uh, at UI. Uh, this uh, involves the kind of people such as Aida, who are of the same spirit uh, uh, as uh, I think I am. Uh, it's also a pleasure to have you all. I understand that many of you are visiting from Germany. Is Dublin. 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 Okay. 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 <laughs> Cornell University. So. Okay. This, uh, where in, in Dublin? University College Dublin. Oh, University. I was at UCL actually in uh, July. I gave a talk there uh, on, on AI. Not this talk. So it's not a fictitious. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming uh, and other friends as well. Um, so uh, I want to. I'm originally from Iran, and uh, I wanted to use this moment actually uh, to voice my wholehearted support for the revolution that is currently underway in Iran. I don't know if you are following the news, but um, uh, women in Iran are, you know, at the forefront of this uh, this uh, social movement, uh, literally a revolution, and uh, it's a very encouraging moment in the you know for for Iran, but also for the rest of the globe because if this works out. I'm sure the effects are going to ripple through the, the region in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, um, it is also frightening because you deal with a regime which is uh, very brutal, killing essentially children. And I, I hate to, to say this, but it is true. Um, uh, I want to plead because we are in Brussels with the members of the European Union to hold the Islamic regime accountable for this. My topic is accountability. So I thought I should use this to also uh, ask for that. Uh, um, this is a moment for real action, for cutting economic and diplomatic ties with, with the Islamic regime and for evicting its agents from the European soil. So wherever you are, I want to ask you to, to please voice your support for this. This is huge. This is very important. Uh, I would also like to ask my friends here at ETUI or whoever else is involved with the unions in, the, um, uh, in Europe to also, you know, uh, lend their support to the people, the political prisoners and workers in Iran. Um, just this week, uh, the British National Education Union wrote uh, uh, a letter to the foreign secretary to support human rights in Iran. I think other players um, in Europe can do the same thing. And I want again to, to ask them to take action. So with that, let me share my screen here. And I have... Uh, because of what is happening, uh, I'm kind of, this is, Maria, this is not, oh, oh, here, sorry, sorry. You see, this is one example of what, going, what I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I was going to say is that uh, because I'm so much, you know, uh, overwhelmed by the situation in Iran, I might be a bit scattered, and I apologize in advance for that. I'll try not to, uh, not to be distracted by things. But if you hear me say things in the middle about about this, uh, just uh, uh, forgive me for that. For that. Uh, so this is this are this is the images of you know of some of the children that have been just. You know, killed in the last two months in, but 
the small bit behind that. Uh, so we have agreed with Aida that I will read uh, some of the beginning comments, you know, from the text because of my mental state, but then we move on to a conversational kind of dialogue. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand and make comments and questions uh, as, as we go, go through this. So the topic of our conversation today is a set of concepts such as agency, autonomy, and accountability that are hard to define, somewhat like the concepts of politics, freedom, and democracy in political theory, the concept of work of art in aesthetics, or the concept of want um, in social psychology. The complexity and value-laden character of these concepts often give rise to conceptual disputes as to what is it and what it is not that is covered under them. So think about democracy, for instance. By what criteria should we decide if a political system is a democracy? Uh, the power of citizens to elect their government, the equality of opportunity for all citizens to attain uh, leadership positions, or the continuous participations of citizens in political life. Which of those? Uh, but some of these criteria, some Western countries are not democracies. If you assume that you know the people are not actively involved in politics. Uh, while Iran is would be considered a democracy, for instance, by this last measure, then because people are very active in politics, which is a very ironic conclusion to draw, right? And I wanted to just use that as an example of you know a, a concept that we feel that we see, we think they understand, but actually when you look closely, it is very contentious, it's very uh, disputable. Uh, we can ask the same questions about autonomy. By what criteria can we say of someone or something that they have autonomy? If they can make decisions free from external interference as negative libertarians suggest, you know, there's a, this school of thought that is a, says that, you know, we are free to the extent that nobody interferes with our decisions, right? Uh, that's called negative freedom because it is, you know, a negative account of freedom, lack of interference or if they are free to pursue their goals and agendas the way they desire, as positive libertarians say. This is the positive notion of freedom, that we can do anything that we want. Freedom. What if they have both types of freedoms, but don't have the means to accomplish their goals? Let's say people are just allowed to do what they want, and they are not constrained by any intervention, but they don't have the options. For instance, if they are poor, right? Um, or they're constrained by their economic needs, right? Then become freedom becomes meaningless. So autonomy in that sense is very like, much like democracy, right? It is debatable. What do we mean by, by what we mean by autonomy? But if people are under the influence of false propaganda or drugs or addiction or a mental condition such as dementia, in the latter case, you know, with people with dementia. Who should be allowed to make decisions on their behalf? So I was recently in Japan, where I learned, you know, I was just uh, observing some uh, uh, senior care facilities. And I learned that, that, you know, a lot of decisions about people with dementia in Japan are made by their family members. In the US, that would be considered illegal because, uh, well, it is violation of, you know, individual rights or privacy and so on. So which of those is the right model? I, I think there are elements of that we can favor, you know, in both cases, right? They're, because if somebody has dementia, how can we rely on them to decide about their, you know, what is right for them? But on the other hand, if you leave it all to the families, then that doesn't sound right either. You see, you see what where I'm going with this, uh, with the complexity of, you know, this notion of autonomy, uh, whether it is with about, you know. Uh, normal people or people with certain types of conditions. As you can see, there's no easy answers to these questions because the answer depends on the criteria we choose to character, characterize a, uh, autonomy. Does a teenager or a person with dementia have autonomy, for instance, as I said? So then we throw the, in the machines to this mix as people have started to do that uh, and things become way more complicated. So with the current state of the art in AI and machine learning, is a self-driving car autonomous? Who should be held accountable if a human being is killed in a crash, as has happened in a few instances already, right? In, in Arizona, in California, 
I, I don't think I don't know of any cases in in Europe where this has happened, but in in the U.S. this has happened. And the question is, uh, who should be held accountable? And we had this conversation this morning in terms of how can, law can deal with this. Uh, should a weaponized drone system, to give you another example, that recognizes someone as an insurgent or terrorist, have the autonomy to decide whether or not to fire at them? Are you familiar with weaponized drones systems they are, that are increasingly used? And they, they are described as autonomous in the sense that the system recognizes through its you know, machine learning techniques and so on, if somebody is a potential risk. And the question is, should we leave the decision to the, to the system? Uh, should a software system decide if you are a viable job candidate, a college applicant, a social welfare beneficiary, or a potential criminal? All of these questions are, as I'm sure you know, are, are uh, coming up more and more because now we have thrown machines into the mix of these conversations about autonomy. So questions like this can give rise to conceptual and social disputes for at least three reasons. Uh, first, they involve a cluster concept, such as autonomy, where, whose meaning involves the and this is from uh, Richard Connolly, a political theorist from a while back in the 1970s, who said that the elaboration of the broader conceptual system within which it is implemented, a cluster concept doesn't have its own meaning unless it is understood in the, in between the cluster of these other concepts. Uh, the second reason is that there are no agreed upon criteria as to what belongs and what doesn't belong to the concept. This is especially the case if you face a dynamic and changing situation such as the heavily computerized environments of our time. So if things are changing, for instance, we have just, I just said that we have added machines to our conversations about autonomy. That's a major change, right? And you know, if you stick to the same old criteria in terms of what belongs and what doesn't belong to, to our conversations, then um, we, are, we are going to be, you know, face problems. <clears throat> The third reason is that people approach these situations from different perspectives or vantage points or value systems, if you wish. So we want to clarify these, these uh, you know, uh, disputes, these conceptual disputes in as best as we can. So the first step to deal with such disputes is to be as clear as possible about one's positions on these issues. That is about the conceptual cluster that one has in mind about one's criteria and about one's vantage point. So let me start by putting my cards on the table in that order. So I, I want to say where I, how I come to this, where I come from when I talk about autonomy and this computer system. First, as you notice in the title of my talk, the cluster that I have in mind includes autonomy, agency, and accountability. But as, I, as I'll explain in a moment, it also includes a number of other related concepts. I'll show you in a second. My main criteria, the second point, is that for evaluating these concepts, uh, we should consider human dignity, which in my mind covers the issues of fairness, equity, and justice, and power. I'll come back to this later as well, but uh, you have to keep in mind that not everybody would agree with that. So if you ask, you know, for instance, you know, somebody in business, uh, and what, is, what is their criteria for evaluating you know, a system or a human being, the criteria might be efficiency or productivity or profit and so on. How can we agree from these, you know, from coming to these things from very different perspectives? Lastly, my vantage point, as captured in the sub subtitle of the talk, is from the margins, as I, as I said, um, by which I mean the interests of those members of the society who are at the margins of economic structure, social status, and political power. Those who are marginalized, in other words, right? So uh, to say, to show why this is important, you might consider some, somebody might say, okay, this is all academic, you know, jumbo uh, or uh, uh, disputes and so on. But I want to be clear why this is important. Why do we have to start with clarifying the terms of the debate, uh, whatever the topic is? Uh, this is what uh, William Connolly said. I'm sorry, I think I earlier said Richard Connolly, it's William Connolly. Uh, it says, those who would exercise from every concept employed in description of the point of view from which it is formed would find 
that they lacked rationale, both for using the concept and for adjusting its criteria to meet those new and unforeseen circumstances that persistently arise in a changing society. And as I said earlier, we do live in a changing society. So this case in Washington DC just was revealed just last week. Uh, what happened is that uh, Washington DC is the center of the power of, uh, of the globe in a sense, right? But people in Washington DC don't know that decisions are made about their lives, not by politicians, but these by these machine learning systems in the city itself. Uh, so uh, investigators who wrote this report found that there are 29 algorithms used by 20 agencies who use automation to screen housing applications, criminal recidivism, uh, food assistance fraud, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you ask the agencies why they do this, the answer is often that it is because of efficiency and objectivity, because we might want to do things, these things faster, but also because computer systems are more objective than human beings. They don't have any bias. That's, that's the claim. So let me stop here and then see if you have anything. Well, yeah, well, maybe, I mean, um... I'm wondering about this uh, concept of automation and whether uh, the, which are the arguments in favor of automation and against automation. I think it's uh, also a very debatable concept. Very much so. I, actually, uh, I already mentioned objectivity and uh, efficiency. So people who make these arguments in favor of uh, computers and automation usually resort to one of these criteria. They say computers are more accurate, they are more efficient, they are more neutral, they are more objective, as I said, they are more reliable, and they are more transparent. As opposed to what? As opposed to human beings who are fallible, clumsy, biased, emotional, capricious, and evasive. That's, that's the kind of thing people might not use these terms, but you know, human beings are unpredictable, right? So if you listen to people who promote these systems, that's the thinking, right, that goes into this, that you look, we cannot rely on human beings for objective, reliable judgment. So let's go to machines. Machines are going to be to, to do a better job at this, whatever the question is, whatever the task is, right? Um, and I think that, you know, we can make the opposite argument. I want to say that that's just one perspective, right? The opposite perspective is to focus on those sides of human humanity uh, that are not considered in these debates, such as, for instance, heteronomy. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, uh, said that we are autonomous to the extent that we are heteronomous. We rely on each other, not just, just as children, but also as social actors, right? People who study human languages talk about heterogalasia, Bakhtin, you know, some of you are familiar with, uh, you know, talks about the tendency of these systems to, to uh, kind of unify, create uniform languages. Whereas the beauty of human language is its diversity and you know the creativity that goes into the language and so on. Uh, there's the issue of labor, right? You know, who creates value? And political economists talk about human capacity to create value. Do machines do that? Uh, or common sense, common sense. I'll talk about common sense in, in a few minutes. You know, human beings have common sense and uh, do machines have common sense? Is common sense a useful thing to have? Any, let me just actually ask you throw that question to the audience here. What is common sense for you when they say pe people have common sense and machines don't? Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, yes. no? Yeah, so I think, uh, well, common sense is a very uh, abstract concept, uh, but uh, in a sense, I, I think common sense is humans we have, um, we have um, a knowledge on, for example, what's at least what's wrong, what's right. Um, we have, I, I think, um, well, it might be wrong, but we have, uh, I think, uh, a sense of, um, I know, hurting someone might be wrong or killing someone might be wrong uh, or hurting someone else might be wrong and other things might be right. I think uh, a machine doesn't have that in the sense that it, it is thought it is taught to do this and it's not going to question it anytime. And, and the idea is that it's by some people is that we can teach machines to gain that com common sense. 
uh, one of the early projects actually in, in artificial intelligence was based on this premise that, you know, if we encode all of human knowledge and, you know, and uh, human common sense and put it in, you know, uh, in propositions that could be, you know, taught, you know, led to the machine, the machine can earn common sense, learn common sense like human beings. And guess what? That project, is, some of you might have heard of the name CYC, C -Y -C, which is a, a kind of the CYC in the middle of encyclopedia. That project has been going on for 40, 50 years. And so far, they are not there, despite every, everything that has happened with technology. So uh, machines apparently cannot have common sense. But uh, what about judgment? And uh, even flaws uh, <coughs> come along with common sense. So it is very complex, you know, and that's why we have to clear our terms of the of the conversation in order for us to, to clear the air. And um, we are half, apparently we have machines on one side and humans on the other. Uh, but what connects these two, 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 con two concepts, if I may? Yeah, so uh, let me skip this and talk about yeah these these two clusters that I uh, that I show you here there's if you listen to these debates we have two types of category groups of concepts that are used in talking about human beings and about machines in talking about the human beings you know as we said concepts such as agency autonomy responsibility accountability and so on come come you know come up in talking about machines Terms such as automation, algorithms, accuracy, objectivity, data, form, content, and these terms come up, right? And increasingly, however, we see a traffic between these two clusters, right? So we use terms that are traditionally applied to human beings to talk about machines. So we talk about autonomous systems, or we talk about even some, some people talk about uh, technolo technological I'm sorry, technical systems held responsible, uh, or what, what do they call it, liability of, of technological systems. On the other hand, we use terms that are applied to machines to talk about human beings, about automating things and bringing humans back into the loop that we were discussing this morning. Um, so that is what, is what is happening. Are there any boundaries? Well, the boundaries are being broken because you know there's, there's a traffic between the, these, two, these two sets of concepts. Uh, one way of connecting them is this notion of rules, uh, because I think the rules are implied in both human behavior and uh, uh, in computers, but in with very different meanings. Uh, Lorraine Dustin, some, uh, who is uh, a social scientist, just recently published a book uh, uh, talking about two types of rules. One she described as thin rules, that is rules that can be followed to the letter without the need for intelligent interpretation, and adaptation to concepts. So these are the rules that usually, you know, people talk about when they have algorithms in mind, right? These are exceptionless and uh, infallible codes of conduct. If you machine, the machine follows, as you were saying, right? All the steps that, you know, that are fed into this in the form of rules. But then how about human beings? What types of rules do we follow? He describes them as sick rules, meaning rules that are context dependent and need the capacity to see when and how to best apply them. That's a very different type of rule. Um, actually, in the old times, the, the term rule, which uh, you know, was used in a very different sense, actually more in the second sense of the term, um, in the form of the model. For those of you who are familiar with the, you know, the monastic rule of Saint Benedict, uh, the, the figure of the, uh, of the uh, abbot was considered a rule in the sense that they provided a model for everybody else to emulate, right? That notion of rule is very different for, from how we understand rules uh, today. And yes. Yeah, continue. No, no, carry on. No, um, I, I can ask later. <laughs> so uh, that brings me to this notion of human judgment. So let me just say a few words about uh, human judgment and uh, the way we differ from machines in terms of we have, how we apply rules. Um, for that, I have to go back to, you know, uh, a little bit in history to Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant uh, described this difference between humans and machines, but not machines, but humans, and how they apply rules in these words. If the understanding in general is explained as the faculty of rules, 
then the power of judgment is the faculty of subsuming under rules, i.e. of determining whether something stands under a given rule or not. General logic contains no precepts at all for the power of judgment, and moreover, cannot contain them. But since it abstracts from all content of cognition, nothing remains to it but the business of analytically dividing the mere form of cognition into concepts, judgments, and inferences, and thereby achieving for formal rules for all use of the understanding. Now, if it wanted to show generally how one ought to subsume under these rules, that is, uh, distinguish whether something stands under them or not, this could not happen except once again through a rule. <laughs> But just because this is a rule, it would demand another instruction for power of judgment, and so on. And so it becomes clear that although the understanding of this line at the top uh, is certainly capable of being instructed and equipped through rules, the power of judgment is a special talent that cannot be taught, but only practice. So I wanted to, to sorry for that long passage, but essentially I want you to listen to what Kant is saying about what is special about human beings that we are not, if you wish, mechanical robots to just follow the rules the way we are taught, you know, we are told to follow. Rather, uh, this is something that we learn in practice, in real life. Um, and that is the main feature of humanity, human judgment, that is very difficult to emulate with machines. Uh, somebody in the 1980s um, turn this into a modern language by saying that we have no algorithms for judgment since every application of a rule would itself need supplementing it with further rules. So this will go on ad infinitum uh, and there's no end to it. How, to, how do we deal with it as human beings? Well, we, we learn it in real life, in practice, in interacting with other people and so on. So that is, that is what makes us special, if you wish. Although if I may, someone might also say that uh, if judgment is a, a result of experience, some machines might have some experience too, don't they? Yes, so that is that is the, 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 somehow the, the, the debate nowadays, right? That machines, you know, in the old times for rule following, but nowadays they are creating their own rules. The, the, these modern algorithms in machine learning are, are uh, very, um, uh, different from the old algorithms. They are not just rules because they come up, machines come up with their own, you know, uh, if you wish, uh, uh, judgment, right? Uh, finding patterns in data and so on. So to get there, let me just quickly review uh, how algorithms actually, like rules have changed in the, throughout uh, the decades. Uh, so early on, you know, as, as you know, uh, this notion of algorithm was uh, invented in algebra by somebody uh, uh, called Al-Kharazmi, who was uh, a Persian Iranian mathematician who, who uh, wanted to provide specific solutions to specific algebraic questions. And that notion of uh, algorithms applied to specific problems was how people understood algorithms early on. Uh, so specific problems such as what? The lengths of the lunar months, or let's say, the solution to a quadratic equation and so on and so forth. So algorithms early on meant something very similar to what how Kant was just talking about judgment. That is something that could be learned in practice. And people were the ones who were in charge of algorithms, not machines. There were no machines calculating machines back then. So that was how algorithms were understood and introduced early on. But then in the industrial era, you know, uh, this notion started to change because we moved into the era of mechanization or what we call automation these days. Um, so in insurance companies, offices, you know, census bureaus and so on, people uh, started to use mechanical devices to make calculations of huge amounts of data back in the 19th century. At this point, it was not human beings who were you know, just doing the, the algorithms. It was a combination of humans and machines, mechanical machines. And then we go, we get into a computing era, and then that even goes further in the sense that uh, now you know some of you might have heard of the name of Donald Knuth, who is you know, whose book is the Bible of computers essentially, and he says you know an algorithm is something like a recipe, uh, meaning that you know if if you give it to somebody, they can follow it very closely. That somebody could be a machine. So an algorithm, all of a sudden from this early notion of something 
specific and concrete dealing with a specific problem turned into something like a recipe that could be followed even, I'm sorry for the term, by an idiot or by a machine, right? So notice how this, these meanings, the meaning of algorithm has changed throughout history from something that is very specific and done by a human being to something that is very general, right? Like a recipe that could be followed by a machine. This is a very different notion of algorithm. Now we get into the, uh, the 80s, we get into expert system. I want to just show you this example of uh, what was called an expert system. The idea of an expert system was that, look, you know, uh, it can help human beings do their jobs better. For instance, medical doctors, right? By providing them, by equipping them with, with computer systems, which were called expert system. This program, Mycene, was one example. And what it did is was given a set of rules uh, so that, you know, if you could put the, you know, the, the, the data, if you wish, the information about the given case, it could infer a diagnosis. Apparently, this is exactly what doctors do, right? They, they diagnose things, they, they look at the case, at the symptoms and so on, and they come to a conclusion. And Mycin did this. So this is an example many of you probably have know uh, computer programming. So if the site of the culture is blood and the gram uh, strain is positive and so on and so forth, then this is a strong suggestive evidence for a certain type of disease, right? That's how Mycin work. And that sounds very powerful. And there were many other similar examples of this that work in other areas, uh, such as in chemical composition of material, which is a very you know, challenging task for, for chemists. Uh, but there was a problem. Uh, so this is a very, uh, this is a real but funny case of, uh, of a system that diagnosed a Chev Chevrolet 1969 with measles. So the, the, the expert system was given a set of symptoms, reddish brown spots on the body. Uh, and the expert system came up with diagnosis that the, the Chevy 1969 has measles, right? And I, this, I know that this might sound very uh, you know, silly, but it is real. This is what happened. There were other cases of a teenager, very similar to machine learning systems these days, who applied for a job and they put 20 years of experience in a, you know, at the job. And the system didn't detect this, not knowing what. What was the system missing? Well, sense. <laughs> common sense, right? exactly. So the system, what is the common sense, common sense here? that you cannot have a longer work experience than your age. You might say, okay, this is so obvious. Why should we you know, tell the machine that, you know, that you know, this, this very obvious fact? That is exactly where common sense comes in. You know, there are so many things that we know as human beings. We, we grow up you know, in, in, you know, interacting with, you know, with our parents and with other people. And we learn things, but we are not explicitly aware of them. Right, this is called tacit knowledge. Right, most of our knowledge is actually of that nature. So, a couple of examples. Uh, you might again laugh at this, but this, you know, it is sounds obvious to us, but it's not obvious to machines. So, all parents are older than their children. That's that's common sense, right? Uh, but except that you can um, insert a caveat and say all biological parents are older than their children. Uh, well, that qualifies the statement, but you see what I mean? This is a very obvious thing to us, but you know, the sky is blue on a sunny day. That's something that we all understand. We, we have you know, seen enough of this to know that on a sunny day, sky is blue, but does the machine know this? The answer is no, unless you tell it explicit, explicitly. So the challenge with these expert systems early on was to make what we know you know, very, uh, very easily and tacitly to turn those into explicit statements. So let me ask you, and this is a, something that we, uh, I usually do in, in some of my classes. How many pieces of this do we know as human beings? You know, five year old, how much common sense knowledge do they have? And what are some examples of that knowledge? What are the things that you would expect a five year old to know? I gave you two examples. So all parents are older than their children. You know, sky is blue or grass is green. Anything else that comes to mind, you know, that we would consider common sense? To put their hand in the fire. 
Yeah, it's, that's a practical common sense, right? And the ch children often <laughs> learn that, you know, in practice, right? And then, of course, sometimes they repeat it and until they know. Right? That's something that exactly comes with experience. Don't put your hand into the fire. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. And you know a lot about profiling their parents and people around them. So they've seen how they interact if they do certain activities. So if they cry, people might comfort them or so on. And they build knowledge of what they expect will happen in a certain yeah. situation where they have had agency. So you, know, you can start to build, that becomes common sense there, like what you think will happen. And they could hypothesize maybe a bit, a bit between the edges about what might happen. Exactly. And the point is, there are two things from what you said. First of all, we are not born with common sense. This is not genetic, right? We, we get it from an environment, from in, interacting with uh, other people, uh, from, from experience and so on and so forth. Second, it is, as I said, it is tacit. It cannot, you know, many people, almost all human beings are aware, know or have access to this knowledge. But if you ask them, they're not going to be able to articulate it, right? Because we don't think about it. Right? We just take it for granted. It's just part of who we are as, as human beings. The challenge is how can we give this to machines? Do mach First of all, do machines need this? And I think the answer is yes. If machines can make judgments, are going to be make decisions about our lives, right? They should have access to, or they should know at least some level of this. And second, how can we do this? Give it to machines. So early on, this is what they tried. And today, and today we have machine learning. Yeah, okay. So machine learning, because that's the that's the name of the game these days, right? That you know, these expert systems failed, they were silly, stupid, you know, they made these mistakes. I didn't tell you about this other last example, but they gave it uh, the machine, this expert system, a case of somebody who had kidney infection. And the solution was by the machine, boil the kidney to get rid of the infection. And I'm not making this up. This is all real. They know that you know these these machines that were very smart, but at the same time, but they were so vulnerable and fragile. And so but let's talk a few minutes about what is happening now, because I, I know that there's a lot of uh, hype, but also a lot of confusion about what machine learning systems are capable of doing and how they do it, right? Uh, I, to just make this a very, uh, I hope, uh, kind, kind of uh, simple, but also maybe to help you memorize this, uh, I've chosen five, uh, four M words that to explain how these systems work. Monitoring, mining, marking, and manipulation. So let me just describe this very quickly. Monitoring has to do with data collection. That is, you know, we, you know, we have these systems uh, or sensor systems, our cell phones, yes, these, right? These are sensors. These are collecting data about us all the time, even when you are sleeping. Uh, even when you turn certain features off, actually there was a lawsuit just last week against Google because it turned out that you know Google traced people you know in the location in, in terms of their location even when they turned off their uh, you know uh, tracking system and uh, a few states in the in the in the US uh, sued Google and it was uh, sued, I think penalized by about four hundred billion dollar million dollars, I'm sorry, which was for Google is a peanut, but you know, you get the point that you are being, we are, well, we are being monitored and data is collected about us all the time from these systems, right? That we use, you know, just to forget about our daily life. The second one is what, what I call mining, that this data is called, that is collected is then mined or analyzed for what purpose, basically to find patterns, right? Or correlations, if you wish. So, you know, somebody who lives in a certain place is of a certain age, right? Uh, and of a certain education, certain racial, ethnic background and so on, they have certain types of tendencies as opposed to somebody, as opposed to somebody else who grows up in a different environment, right? That is what mining does. It, it, you know, and the purpose of that is of course the next one. That is the, now after you have your data is collected and mined, you're marked, literally. I mean, that is called categorization or, or customization or it comes with different names in the sense that inferences are made about you. So if you are white, a white teenager of 14 years old, you are more likely to favor a certain type of music. You, you can tell me what, uh, right? As opposed to jazz that I like, for instance, right? So that is, uh, that is what is 
what I mean by marking, that people are put into these buckets, if you wish. They are categorized, right? For the purposes of, purpose of what, among other things, of course, marketing, right? Because then you can sell things to people according to the taste and to the bucket in which they, you have put them in. But then you can do it for political campaign campaigns, which is why, you know, uh, these systems are very widely used in, uh, you know, by people who run, run political campaigns, among other things. So it's not just, you know, uh, commercial agencies and advertisement, but it's also politics. And then finally, it is the last M word, which is manipulation. Then once they know you about you and they have put you in the right bucket, they can manipulate you. You can nudge you, push you in different directions and so on, persuade you to do certain things, whether it is voting for somebody or buying a certain item. So that's that's what how these systems work. Today. Today, yeah. Hamid, what do we have for the future? Well, I don't know what we have for the future, but there are areas I have to say that, you know, this is, I, I don't want to sound negative. There are areas where this works very, very nicely. So drug discovery is an area where this machine learning techniques have been effectively used to develop new drugs. This is some somewhat what happened during the COVID, that, that you know, new drugs, new vaccines were developed uh, partly using this kind of techniques of, uh, of data mining and so on, among other things, you know, not just COVID. But we apply the same thing to online dating. So the same technique that is used for drug discovery or for medic medications is used to match people. And you might wonder, I mean, is, is how, how does that work and does it work? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Many people use this these days and it works, right? Uh, but to what extent, at what cost, right? We don't we don't usually ask this question. And this is more of a personal choice. I'm not going to make any any generic judgments about whether or not you know online dating is, is working or not, but uh, it gets to social systems, that's a different story. So when when you when people make these choices about their personal life. I don't think we can we can we have to say much about that. But when it gets to uh, decisions of the type that we were talking about earlier about you know job applicants and you know student applicants and so on, uh, then it's a different story. So this is a book that you know by two computer scientists that uh, came out a few years ago, and uh, they have to say this. This is not me. These are two computer scientists who are thinking about algorithms and how to make them ethical. But they say in traditional Algorithmic design, while the output might be useful, like a sorted list of Facebook use usage times, that output is not itself another algorithm that can be directly applied to further data. <clears throat> in contrast, in machine learning, that's the entire point. For example, think about taking a database of high school information about previously admitted college students, some of whom graduated from college and some of whom did not, and using it to derive a model predicting the likelihood of graduation for future applicants. You see the point that, you know, you have a model, right? You have a set, you know, a set of the group of students, you have their records and you, you know from what they have done, which one of them succeeded in college, which ones did it. And then you want to use that to, to for the next round, you know, who to admit, not, who not to admit, right? Rather than trying to directly specify an algorithm for making these predictions, which could be quite difficult and subtle, and they're right, we write a meta algorithm that uses the historical data to derive our model or prediction algorithm. Machine learning is sometimes considered a form of self-programming since it's primarily the data that determines the detailed form of learned model. This data-driven process is how we get algorithms for more human-like tasks, such as face recognition, language translation, and lots of other prediction problems. Indeed, with, the, with this explosion of consumer data enabled by the internet, the machine learning approach to algorithm design is now much more the rule than the exception. But the less directly involved human, humans are with the final algorithm, the less aware they may be of the unintended ethical, moral, and other side effects of those models. This is two computer scientists who are interested, who are working on ethical algorithms. So I want to just, uh, if you don't mind, uh, use this and make some final, final comments. So we, we learned three things from these two computer scientists. First of all, new meta algorithms are different from earlier ones in that they are self-programming models. So it is not that 
and this is very important to keep in mind that you know these algorithms are not written by human beings. Algorithms emerge as models from the data that is already fed into the system, right? That's, that's one thing. The other one, the same data-driven process is applied everywhere, including what they describe as human life tasks. So it's not just about drug discovery, for instance, but it's also about college admission and all these other examples that we talked about. Third, that consumer data is central in this process. Our data is central to this process. So what does that imply? <laughs> well, you hear about algorithmic bias all the time, and this is just one example. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen this, right? That the person on the left, the man, you know, uh, according to us, this software system was uh, ranked at the, with a risk of three. The woman on the right was ranked at the risk of eight. Uh, and guess what? The man was a real you know, criminal. Uh, the woman was not. And um, this is an example of uh, what people call algorithmic bias. Yeah, there's a, in this case, it's a racial, racial bias, of course, but we might get other type of, type of subtle biases in, in how these systems work. So that's one obvious thing. The other one is this notion of consumer data. I, uh, I use the term, as some of you know, this term of heteromation to talk about this, that uh, it is our data that is used to, uh, you know, to drive the systems. But uh, whenever you go to Facebook or you use Twitter or use any other of these software applications, you are providing data that is the source of value and profit for major corporations. You never think about it in those terms, right? Because it seems all volunteer. You know, I'm, I'm connecting with my friends. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, using this for navigation and so on. But there is, that's how these major corporations make profit, right? Facebook without its users is nothing. Uh, just, just literally, right? If Facebook doesn't have any users, there's no income. Right, and we, again, we don't think about this as as work and labor and so on. But that's what it is. We are working uh, essentially, you know, in some fashion for these corporations, and that has something that, that that is something that we have to keep in mind when we talk about these systems as um, uh, in 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 terms of you know the social and economic role. And let me just add, uh, end on this note that you know what I have tried to describe, and I hope that I did. Maybe it's not as clear as I was hoping that we see a historical trajectory when we look at these algorithms, a kind of a downward historical trajectory. Uh, in medieval times, as I said, people were at the center. You know, even when algorithms were involved, people were the, the ones who did the, the, the calculation, the job, right? In industrial era, uh, it was a combination of people and machines, right? But people were still kind of in control, right? Because they drove the, you know, the systems, uh, uh, by the time we get to you know computer automation, uh, somehow that rolls, there's a role shift or switch, if you wish, that now machines are making decisions. And that has become more and more prominent in recent times, especially in the last 10, 15 years, which, uh, which I, as I described, is uh, you know, we are providing a lot of value. We are just not acknowledged. We are not recognized uh, as value producers. So what's the solution? Well, Somebody might think that, you know, what I'm trying to say is we have to go back to the medieval, medieval times and just throw out the machines and so on. That's exactly not what I'm saying, all right? Uh, so be, oftentimes when people like me talk, you are understood as these Luddites, right? Or against technology and you say, okay, let's not stop technology. That's not the point. Can we think about alternatives, you know, that, that are emancipatory, right? That, that, were, that can bring human dignity back. Uh, and I know that that is more, sounds more like a slogan and a motto rather than, than a practical thing. But history, if history is any evidence, uh, there should be more creative ways of thinking about these technologies that would put us on that track. So that's what I, how I want to, to end and on that note that, you know, let's think about, you know, this, uh, when you are, the people sitting here, um, you are the young generation. This is going to be in your control, in your hands, uh, more than anybody else. So you can decide whether you want to play along with these systems or you want to put them in a you know in, in a different use and you know uh, and for human dignity for human emancipation if you wish.
surfacing of the human dignity it hasn't been hasn't been away from the human. It is there. It's, a, it's, a, it's an essential element in every human being. But uh, yeah, data goes over it. But uh, the idea of surfacing it even more, I think, is what I take it from your um, from your class. <laughs> Thank you, Hamid. And I would like to open the floor to your questions and comments. And please just. Michael, thanks for this, Hamid. I, wa I wonder, we see in the recent couple of years, particularly a growing trend for computer scientists to point to things like large language models as somehow you know, bridging the gap between machine learning and common sense or this general understanding of the world. For those who don't know, these are models that take huge corpuses of text. So things like entire web crawls of whatever th and things on the on the web. They look at when words kind of are together and then the machine learning system structures those words so that it can predict text that seems convincing and people use it to cheat on their essays and so on by writing uh, by writing fake summary. Says, don't do that, don't do that. Um, but um, I like, you know, there's also a lot of crit critics who say, well, all it could ever learn is the co-occurrence of words. It can't learn things about the world how do you see sort of those trends that people claiming that machines can now do the things that you were criticizing both expert systems and machine learning systems to do? Um, and, and what's your what's your take yes, on that's this? That's uh, a great two million dollar question. Uh, so two, two answers to that. Uh, the, the prominent example of this is GPT-3, right, which is this model that can not only uh, produce text, but produce text that is indistinguishable from human produced text. It's very creative and, and so on and so forth. It looks very smart, uh, but with the caveat, first of all, you know, there was, uh, my friend Doug Hofstetter uh, ran a, a few experiments on this and they published it in The Economist. Some of you might have seen it. You know, they, they posed tricky questions to GPT-3 to see how it responds. So let me give one example. How long does it take to transfer the Golden Bridge across the the English Channel. About 20 minutes if you fall. <laughs> just some came up with a number. GPT-3 came up with an answer with that. But that's a silly, I mean, I know we all laugh, right? What does that even mean, right? To, how, so let me repeat that question. How long does it take to transfer the Golden Bridge across the English Channel? And the system I said, said three hours or whatever. And then, you know, things like that. So there's a gap here of an obvious gap of still common sense. Of course, you might say it's people who, uh, or promoters of these systems might say this is just very, you know, 5% of the time. The other 95% they work, but can we rely on these systems with this huge gap of common sense to make decisions for us? That's one thing. But in more positively, in response to your questions, I think uh, I, deep down, I'm not a skeptic about the possibility of AI. I, mean, I have to play my cards openly. I think we can do this. But how? That's the question. And my answer, if you, if you were to give you a keyword, is participation. These systems have to be kind of woven into our, our social life in terms of not just getting collecting data about us, right, and fed data, but also really, you know, doing things, if you wish. That's what I mean, practical participation. I know that that's a very... It's still a very vague term. What does it mean for, for computer systems or robots to participate? But it is part practical action, participation, very much the same way that, hum that human children, you know, acquire knowledge and experience, right, by participating in social life. So at some point or whenever we get there, and current technology is not able to do, to, to do that. Current machine learning, I can guarantee, is not going to happen. Uh, but that doesn't dismiss the possibility of that's, uh, at some future point of some other ways of you know doing this because and the reason I say this is that deep down I believe that you know there's no privilege for yeah. carbon over silicon. It's not we are not special that just because we are you know organic material, right? Some many people would disagree with that, of course, and I, I totally respect. I understand that. Uh, I sometimes find myself you know having doubts. You know, do, does it take living uh, organisms to be intelligent. Uh, at, up, up until now, I have not arrived at that conclusion. I think 
actually the opposite. So uh, there are these two sides of the story. I, I don't think that current systems have common sense, actually. We have another question, Hamid. Yes, Can we take it? So I'm Roland Dern. I'm lecturing industrial relations. And as we are in the European Trade Union Institute, um, I would question you on your downward track. <laughs> yes. Because it's true that the automatization has um, kind of put workers under the control of the moving assembly line, for instance. But workers responded to that and they resisted being just an object of the moving assembly line. You know, the film Modern Times of Charlie Chaplin shows very nicely. And then we had labor movements, then we had labor laws, then we had um, rest breaks. So we have a whole machinery of labor law kind of limiting the machine, so to speak, of Henry Ford. And the question is, how, how, how can the, what can labor law do? For example, also a question to you, Aida, what can labor law do to control these algorithms to get a counter current against them or, or put them into their boxes to some extent? I should let Aida and some of my other colleagues in this audience to respond. I'm not, I'm not a law, uh, you know, kind of, I, I don't have any expertise in law, but uh, yeah. Please go ahead, because we spent the whole morning, morning trying exactly. to for that question, yeah. but I would like to hear you. Yeah, I would let Michael, do you want to interject? No. <laughs> okay, so there are so different angles. Let me just give you one example. And uh, uh, our colleague already left. Uh, he, he was uh, an expert in this one. <laughs> You can say something later, but yeah, yeah. But but uh, people talk about liability and responsibility, uh, and there are two extremes of, of, of right, uh, including uh, when you talk about labor law. You know that who is responsible for what type of uh, you know uh, when when harms are done. That's that's a different question from what you are asking. You are talking about protection of labor, right? Against what though? So uh, are we protecting, are we trying, or should we be protecting labor against machines? Or is it protection against? The algorithm, you know, like job applications, uh, uh, injustices there, Google uh, or delivery. You now there is a discussion about platform economy directly. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so, so do, if you want my honest answer is that I think that's all a distraction. I think that the, what, what, what this uh, the major players of the current socioeconomic system are doing, they are putting the responsibility on algorithms and on machines to remove responsibility from the real decision makers, which is corporations and um, and so on. And I understand that that's a very kind of uh, broad umbrella way of talking about this. But I think ultimately, uh, as much as you know, these systems are automated. Uh, there are human beings who are making decisions in terms of how they operate or how they, you know, remember at the beginning I was talking about the values, you know, that are injected into systems, <coughs> the same type of values that we have you know, in our debates about, let's say, autonomy. So I think there are, it is the values of the current economic system, should we name it, capitalism, that is driving many of these designs, right? Um, so I would like to think that there are alternative systems, economic systems that can perhaps you know, move us in a different direction. And you know, putting the responsibility on where, where it belongs, namely on the power players. You can call them corporations or capitalists or whatever, that's, that's my honest answer. I know that uh, there's a lot of nuance in that has to be injected into this. I, I'm not saying that it is easy, but that's how I would start. That you know, let's let's not uh, uh, point the the responsibility or the blame on the machine. It's not algorithms that make decisions. Ultimately, somebody you know, a, a system that in which they are embedded. Is there any other question? Yes, go ahead. No, maybe I've. Uh, I... Maybe I got you wrong, my out of curiosity, actually, before you were saying that uh, we might develop and design like this machine, like as, as human beings. So you were saying that you were quite uh, optimistic, might potentially. So it's quite a, more a provocation, I would say. So do you think this you might imply that we might arrive to an era of full automation of labor, or this is not? Great question. 
Well, not, uh, if, if I may, if, again, if I may follow up on what I just yes. said, not in a capitalist system. So, so that's what I mean when I say these systems are embedded in uh, technologies embedded in socioeconomic system. Capitalism cannot possibly create full automation because why? And look at the pandemic, right? You know, uh, there's all this talk about automation and technology doing magic. Why did we have to put people's lives and life, you know, and well-being at risk when we would call them what essential workers? Right? That was the term. Why did we have to do that? You might ask. Because capitalism goes wherever there's profit. When but what, what whatever it is less costly to do things, right? So my very clear answer to that question is that not under capitalism. Full, we, are, we are not going to have full automation under capitalism because capitalism needs human labor. It thrives on human labor. In principle, we can have full automation in a non-capitalist system. Meaning that, you know, a system that is, you know, the, who's driving kind of motive or, or, or engine is not profit. It is human welfare. Under such a system, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of automation. Does that answer? Yeah. Is the answer they won't. Yeah. Nicola. Can I ask a follow-up question to this question? You, you concluded by saying we cannot have full automation in a capitalist system. But could it also be that you mean if we have full automation, we would no longer have a capitalist system? The two are different propositions. <laughs> yeah. Very good question, Nicola. Uh, uh, well, you know, you know, I, I, I apologize. You know, I some be sometimes I'm an academic, so uh, I try to avoid using jargon, but it's sometimes in, in, inevitable. So, in response to that. I would say many of you probably have heard of technological determinism. That is, you know, it is technology that drives history and, you know, social change and so on. Uh, with that in mind, I'm not a technological determinist. So my answer to that question is that full automation is not going to emancipate us. No. <laughs> so the flip side is not correct. That this is not, we shouldn't rely on, on technology to emancipate us. Human beings should emancipate themselves. Once they do that, they can put technology to good use. Uh, that's how I think about it. And with that, if there is no other question or comment, Hamid, I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for this fantastic lecture and, and you, of course, for being part of it. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to close this AI talk and see you next time. Okay. So we, as the Dublin USD group, we go up uh, some floors to our official welcome and a big welcome. Uh, thank you for, for your.